I see lots of tutorials about Docker and Ansible. I see lots of tutorials about high availability hosting or um, you know, making a really bulletproof hosting, but I, I don't see a lot of thought leadership around the entire development workflow from the moment you start writing code for everybody on your team to the moment you put your application live and then you repeat that over and over and over again, sometimes maybe even several times a day in, uh, I've seen many sites and many projects that are deploying code changes uh, many times throughout the day. Um, even if they're really, really big, um, you can still manage to do that. Facebook's a great example of that. They, they're continuously deploying um, new things across their site all the time. So this isn't a recipe, this is more of um, my talk, OCD deployment. Um, is more of a where I think we should be going with it. It's like the goal. If you were to you know, think about what the goal is, what the ideal is for a deployment of an application, this is it, in my mind. Um, and so who knows what OCD stands for in, in English? <laughs> Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. I don't mean that, but I wanted you to think that. <laughs> um, so why do we need to think about um, OCD deployment? Why do we think, why is this important? Um, and I'll tell you why. It's because when you spend a heck of a lot of time in your life building something amazingly big and amazingly important, and it comes down to one moment in time when you put that thing live, when you set that thing afloat, you really want to know. You really, really want to know. You really want to know. <laughs> that it's going to go well. Ooh, I like that. More bass tone. <laughs> so that's a metaphor for a bad website deployment. Um, I saw an example of that recently. Uh, the site went live and they ended up having to switch their DNS back and forth five times before it actually stuck the right way. That's kind of a deployment that you don't want to have. That's downtime, that's lost revenue. So when I talk about a web application, I'm talking about three things. Obviously, code. Everybody here writes code? Yeah, I'm assuming? Yeah. But there's also infrastructure, OK? And this is a very exciting time for infrastructure. Not only do we have the cloud and many clouds, and the prices are falling, and we can buy really massive servers and spin them up in a second, uh, but we also have new tools for deploying infrastructure, or at, le at least the services that run on that infrastructure. So how many of you have played around with Docker? OK, a couple of you. And very importantly, and often left out of the equation when you're thinking about deploying a web application is the data. And data can be everything that any of the services need in terms of persistent storage to run. So MySQL database, uploaded image, uh, solar index, basically anything that your application needs in terms of the actual data, and that can be distributed over many different services. In a Drupal application, it's really common to have at least uploaded files, database, and a solar index. If you don't have all three of those things, by the way, you've got a hell of a mess. Okay, You have a broken application in most cases. You can't really test your application if you don't have code, infrastructure, and data. I always like to think about an example from the e-commerce world. If you're selling shoes, you're using solar, faceted navigation, and you have boots. You want to test boots for the boot sale. If you don't have pictures of boots and boots in your solar index, then you can't test the application for your winter sale. OK, deployment. So that's web application. What do I mean by deployment? Deployment is the process of moving your application and code through different environments for different reasons. Obviously, um, you probably do a lot of the development on your local environment, your laptops. Um, you might have a dev server that you s share with other colleagues. You might have a staging server where you do some continuous integration or where you show your uh, stakeholders or customers what you've done and have them sign off on it. And finally, you put it into prod. But the reality of deployment is actually more like this. It's everybody's local developments. It's several testing environments. It's maybe a staging uh, server here, a, a load testing server there. And it's just a lot of deployment. So 
it, you can see it becomes actually very relevant very quickly with all of these different environments whether or not you can do that in a very um, organized way, in an OCD way, and I'll get to what that means in a moment. And you can see on the internet over and over again that this is a real need. How do I migrate from test environments to production environments on Drupal Answers? I've got broken links after migrating Drupal site from my local machine to my live server on Stack Overflow. On Drupal.org, home page missing theme and CSS after migrating to a VPS host. Up updating to PHP 5.4 breaks Drupal 7.5. Dealing with solar indexes on development and live environments from Drupal.org. It just goes on and on and on. These are the questions that people are asking right now on the internet about using Drupal. And it's not just Drupal, it's actually any web application. Because, like I said, if you don't have your code, infrastructure, and data in one tight package, all you've got is a big mess. And as we know, professionally, the last thing we want is a big mess because in terms of our careers, in terms of our reputation, a big mess can actually be life-threatening. So that, that video right there made you glad you came to my session and not uh, <laughs> the other one, right? Okay, OCD. What do I mean? I mean orchestrated, consistent, and deterministic. That is what I mean when I say OCD deployment. So let's go through those. Orchestrated. In English, that means plan to produce a desired effect. In application speak, what it actually means is the provisioning of servers, storage, network, um, launching and configuring of services on those servers, like MySQL, PHP, Solar, Redis, Memcache, RabbitMQ, whatever you need. Then deploying the code and the data onto those servers with services and monitoring maintenance and change management of all of that. So it's actually a really huge topic. For example, if you want a high availability Drupal site, just talking about the orchestration, here's what you do. You've got to spin up some servers. Probably, I'm saying two at the minimum, three's better. After that, you can probably make high availability a reality. You need something like HAProxy or Nginx load balancing. You need PHP FPM. You need MariaDB or Postgres. You need those in a clustered configuration so that either they're master slave or master, 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 or something like that. You need Solar or Elasticsearch, also in high availability configuration, also with load balancing failover. You need Redis or Memcache, and you need to know whether those are high availability or whether they're just failover, and you need to configure everything to work, and you need to test all those situations so that you know if you have any problem in any of that, you know that your site's going to stay online. Huge, huge amount of work with a lot of uh, really, you know, fine nitty gritty configuration and testing and uh, dealing with very esoteric edge case uh, problems all the time. It's a pain. Orchestrated also means um, you have to ha test your disaster recovery, what happens if things fail. Um, you have to do change management. It's not enough to deploy these one time. Those softwares are going to change. The configurations are going to need to be adjusted and you need to be able to do all of that in an organized way, in a way that you can do over time, maintain the security of your site, maintain the performance of your site. And guess what? That's just one environment, if you really want to test your application with a copy of that environment so that you know it's going to run the same every time you deploy it, you have to find a way to do that for all of those different environments for every developer. Every staging, every testing, every performance, every, every QA, and then in production. You need the whole thing. And you need to know things like it can gracefully shut down and restart, and you uh, can cut the network access between different services and it'll survive, and you need to think about how you or the other people in your organization access those servers with their key management, and you need to know that if something goes wrong in the middle of the night, somebody gets a, a pager or a phone call and wakes up and fixes it, and it goes on and on. That's all under orchestration for me. Uh, beyond that, remember I emphasized data in the, in the trilogy of what an application is with code, infrastructure, and data. 
the persistent storage of web applications in the in in develop in the in the story about deployment is a really sticky part. Okay, so your web application is going to need persistent storage that's also high availability. That means some sort of NFS or GlusterFS uh, or something similar. Uh, and you need every service that is running on there to be able to access it. And you need to be able to move that data onto different environments so that you can test those environments with the data that you've got in production or maybe in the other direction if you're moving data into production to make a new version of the site, you need to be able to test that too. And you need to know that you know, those storage facilities aren't going to fail if you've got just an NFS mount and that fails, your whole application's offline, what good was it doing all of everything that I talked about on the previous slide? You know, you did all that hard work and then your storage fails, your, your application's still offline. And there's security. We could talk about that forever, let's skip it. So, when we built Platform SH and we were thinking about this ideal of orchestrating a web application through different environments, and we asked ourselves, as a developer, what would be the ideal way to orchestrate, say, a MySQL server, or a PostgreSQL server, or a MongoDB, or a Node.js? What would I want to do? What's the, what's the, what's the best way to do it? And we thought, the best way to be able to do it would be able to take a YAML file that we're all getting familiar with because of Drupal 8 anyway, uh, and be able to write, MySQL, how much storage does it need? Git commit, git push, it's there. That's kind of the ideal that we um, came up with, and so we worked towards a system that would uh, give you that. So on platform.sh, for example, you've got a services YAML file, and from all of the potential services that you can have, Elasticsearch, Solar, Redis, Memcache, Node.js, and so forth, and by the end of the year we'll have like 40 of those, then you just write the ones you need, how much storage they need, how much other resource they need. You put that into your Git repository, and when you push that to your environment, it provisions those services ready to use in your application with all of that orchestration that I just talked about. And as you think about your deployments or any other service that you hire or buy uh, for de uh, deployment, hold it against that standard. Is it that easy to run your services on all of the different development, staging, testing environments? Or do you have to do a lot more work? Or do you have to make other trade-offs? And all of those other things, like the mount points for the persistent storage, or uh, how cron is configured, or uh, how the application is going to connect to those services, those can also be abstracted down to very straightforward, simple YAML files. Um, for example, um, the bit that I've got here, it's kind of hard to read in here uh, because of all the light, but those are the mount points that Drupal would need, for example, public, private, and temporary. As a developer, it feels really nice to be able to just write those mount points into this file and know that when I push that up to my environment, then I've got storage, right? And when I push that into production, it's high availability storage, and I can move the data in between those environments without uh, having to do anything hard. So those are the services, for example, that are really common these days that you can put into that YAML file. Um, and then um, that slide's kind of uh, out of place, but I didn't talk about deployment targets yet, but also then it's also nice to be able to choose where you deploy your application once you've gone through all that work of making it. Okay, on to the next bit. Consistent, what do I mean by consistent? So that was orchestrated, OCD, orchestrated, consistent, deterministic. Consistent means acting or done in the same way over time. And when I apply that to the idea of deploying a web application, it means that no matter whether I'm deploying it to my laptop, no matter whether I'm deploying it to an environment for uh, staging or QA or a demo for my cu customer, or whether I'm deploying it finally onto the massive pr uh, production infrastructure that can handle millions and millions and millions of requests an hour, I want to be able to say that I do that deployment exactly the same way every time. Like my methodology for deploying is exactly the same on every environment. That's the goal. 
Okay, that is a great goal to have because if you think about what we probably have today, deploying your application to your laptop means setting up MAMP, WAMP, XAMP, or spinning up um, an Ubuntu, maybe in a virtual machine, getting the PHP and the Apache and Nginx all set up, maybe with some Puppet or Ansible script that you found somewhere on GitHub, and then you do all your data import, and some days later, you're ready to actually start developing if you're starting from scratch. Uh, if you've done it before, you can get it done in a day, but you're still gonna lose a day setting it up the first time, and you'll still have some um, rough points along the way. That's a really crappy way to deploy. <laughs> and if you consider putting an application onto your laptop, actually one of the deployments, then you can see that you've already failed at th this ideal uh, right there. And then, Let's say you have a development server for yourself or your company. How do you deploy there? Okay, you've kind of got to go through that same process again, uh, or maybe somebody's done it for you. Maybe you're using like a Pantheon, and you know they've got DevStage Prod there for you. Um, how do you actually put the code there? How do you change things? Well, on Pantheon, you can't change things. You use the services they've given you. Um, but you can push your code with git push, and that is the consistent way to deploy the application. That's great. That's really, that's the way it should be. Um, Acquia, same thing. Eventually you just say git push, your application is deployed. Heroku, also the same thing. You push uh, your code to git, open shift from Red Hat, same thing. You git push. So there are actually a lot of services, including platform.sh, where the consistent methodology for deploying your application is simply to push a package of code to an environment and it's deployed. Maybe you have to combine that with a data synchronization. Hopefully there's a tool that makes that easy and for all of the services that you're running. Um, if, yeah, get push, I thought I was on that slide already. Um, if you're doing this already, then you're using best practices. If you're not doing this already, then I'm giving you something aspirational that you can achieve and strive for in your development workflow that might improve things for you. So the consistency in an OCD deployment will guarantee you some things. It means that you're going to use the same tools to deploy on every environment. It gives you the fact that you know when you go from local to dev to test the storage that it will work every time because it's doing the same thing over and over and you have a lot of confidence when you go into production because you've actually been practicing the whole deployment every time you move the application through a different environment. And since you're using a consistent infrastructure and actual data, um, you know, you can, you can actually test and show your clients real things instead of saying, imagine that I had some boots in my catalog, then you'd see the boots on sale here. Back to my boots example from e-commerce. The weak link in this, uh, in most cases right now, is local. Um, and this is where Docker and Ansible, if you haven't tried it, are becoming really popular because they give you a way to spin up different services in different containers that you need, like Solar, MySQL, PHP, and do it in a really simple and fast way. Um, but even with Docker, the data synchronization is a mess. Think a 10 gigabyte database, right? 10 gigabytes of data. You want to MySQL export that? Who knows how long that takes on a fast server? Come on, somebody say it. Really, 10 gigabytes? I want your server. <laughs> Three hours? What do you think? Three hours, yeah? Then you have to uh, SFTP or SCP that file to your local machine. Gigabyte of data? I don't know. My internet connection at home? It's going to take 40 minutes just to get the file. Import it on my laptop into MySQL? Five hours. Horrible. Just horrible, right? Uh, that can actually become a lot better. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But the weak link right now is the local environment, and the weak, weak, weak link is the data synchronization. So um, consistency. 98% of the time, you want your data to come from the production environment. Maybe it needs to be sanitized, customer uh, emails taken out. Maybe you only need a portion of the data. Maybe you don't need all million uh, boots in your catalog. Maybe you only need 10,000 of your boots. Um, sometimes, 2%, you need to push data into production as part of your deployment. So you need to be able to do both things. 
And finally, deterministic. So OCD, orchestrated, consistent, deterministic. Deterministic meaning for every event there exist conditions that could, own, that could cause no other event. It's like predestiny, right? This, pr this deployment into production is destined to go well or destined to fail. But it's deterministic, okay? There's only one outcome. That is a goal, an aspirational goal for you when you're thinking about your deployments. Uh, and if we tie that into the consistency part of it, then our philosophy at platform.sh is that for every Git repository you have, if you hash the whole repository, you've got just a hash, exactly the same application should be deployed everywhere you deploy it, every time you deploy it, no matter what. That's the philosophy that we think uh, developers should be striving for these days because anything that diverges from that is a surprise waiting to happen for you or your clients and those surprises tend to come at the wrong times, aka ships falling into the water. So, um, another thing that plays into this and makes it really important to think about the deterministic quality of your deployment is that we are now building applications more and more that have to be built at the code level, compiled even, okay? We came to PHP maybe from uh, Java or C, C++ or .NET um, environments where we compiled code, okay? And I've, probably everybody who's got a computer science background of any kind has compiled code, right? And even if you haven't, you've probably compiled code. And you know that that's a lot harder and long-winded to test your application than it is with PHP where you click save and hit refresh, right? Click save, hit refresh, click save, hit refresh. But guess what? Our PHP applications are running away from us. We now compile the CSS. <laughs> we now get dependencies from Drush, Make, and Composer. And in fact, we now, we now see Drupal applications where you have to like move into different directories and run npm install, okay? This is crazy shit, people. We're building our applications the way Java used to. It's not quite that bad, but we live in this great time where there are lots of high quality repositories of code around the web, and we love to use the work of other people in other open source communities in particular, and that's great. And it makes everything so much more powerful than what we could do on our own. And the best way to do that is to build that code by going and grabbing the latest version, running some tests on it, and shipping it. So these days, you need a build process for your code that takes into consideration things like DrushMake, Composer, NPM, PIP, and RubyGems, because you probably will run into applications where you need all of those, or at least some of those. And as we do more and more Node Drupal stuff, um, you'll see that growing even more. I mean, a great example of that is this, right? Who does this? Who's familiar with that? Ruben, you're not looking. <laughs> <laughs> he raised his hand. <laughs> okay, this is now part of a lot of the Drupal site's deployment process, is that you actually need Ruby to go in and compile your CSS. Okay, guess what? If you're the themer, you might have never had to, you know, integrate a compiling deployment process into your development workflow. And if you're not the themer, and you don't have Ruby, and you've never used Compass, then you, can act, you can't actually change the CSS on your site, even if you want to make things, you know, just one shade lighter blue, and you know how to do that, you know, like I would. Like, I can put red one pixel solid boxes around any div on the page. I'm really good at that. But I couldn't do that if I had to compile the SAS, because uh, I've never done that. So this is like, Every time we add something like this that gives convenience to some people, it takes convenience away from other people. And if the themer is the only person with Ruby on their machine and they're compiling their SAS, checking it in to get, pushing it up to the server, it blocks everybody else out of the theming process, even if the fix is really simple. So our philosophy, which I'm giving to you as an aspirational goal, is that this should be part of a centralized build process. It shouldn't be the themer doing that. It should be the build process doing that. Um, and back to the deterministic part, when you do that, there should only be one outcome. It could, like everybody who does it with this Git repository, every time you do it, it should have exactly bite-wise the same result on the, on the hard drive when you're done. 
That's the goal. So there's some obvious and less obvious parts of this. It's obvious in terms of the infrastructure that you want to have the same services running everywhere you are, on your local, on your dev, on your stage, on your QA, on your UAT, whatever you call it. You want the same version of PHP, the same version of MySQL, the same version of all of the services. You want to have Solar. I see a lot of people who are launching Drupal sites into production that are meant to use Solar. They don't even have Solar installed locally. How can you test the application? How can you really know that that's going to work? You can't. It's less obvious, though, that when you change the infrastructure uh, and deploy that, you should be able to reverse it. So like, uh, it's, it's even worse than you know, not getting things set up the first time right. It's that you might have changing infrastructure over time. You need to make sure those changes follow through all of your environments so that if they upgrade PHP on the production server, you have a way to upgrade PHP locally and stay in line with that. This is a really hard problem, as you can see, if you really want to do it the right way. And as I mentioned, the hard, hard, hard problem is the actual data. Um, data is easily partitioned and fragmented. So for example, uh, remember that multi-gigabyte database export. Let's say we do that MySQL dump on production, but it's a production site. We've got users coming and uploading profile pictures and cat videos. In the time that you have done a MySQL dump, you've got new data on there. Guess what? If you then go into an rsync of your file system, inconsistent. Either you've got stuff in the database that isn't on the file system, or vice versa. And it gets even worse when you throw solar into the mix, because then you're going to pull all that stuff down to some other place, and you're going to re-index solar, which is going to take another day and a half. And guess what? You're going to have solar stuff that's pointing to pictures that don't exist, and stuff that's in your file system and on your database that solar will never find out about. And it's a mess. So uh, are you scared of deployment yet? <laughs> I hope so. So an OCD deployment is definitely not a MySQL dump and a MySQL import. It's definitely not an rsync for files. And if you have to re-index Solar as part of your deployment, you're screwed. So is there a way out of this hole? <laughs> OK, so um, I'm going to show you a fairly outdated at this point video, because I didn't get a chance to make a new one, uh, of platform.sh that just demonstrates a couple parts of this aspiration um, the way we've conceived of it. Um, this is half product marketing and half showing you that you can actually do this stuff. So um, let's see here. Is it going to start? I never know if it's running. Yes, OK. So um, this is just the beginning of a platform.sh project. Um, you could choose a symphony project because platform can run any PHP application. You could choose WordPress. But here we are, Drupal Camp CS. Let's choose Drupal 8, experimental. So platform gets set up. This is uh, just what it looks like. And now I'm going to show you the world's quickest Drupal 8 installation ever. You never knew that Drupal 8 could be installed this fast. I mean, look at, look at it go. It's a thing of magic, and boom, there it is. So um, Drupal 8, of course, beautiful, out of the box. Um, but let's go, that was a deployment, OK? That was deploying basically onto the master branch. Now you have code, infrastructure, and data in one form, right? Like, it's very minimal, but it's there. When I make that branch there, that is just a git branch. But for every git branch I have, I have a complete copy of the application with all of the running services, all of the data, all of the infrastructure, everything on its own branch, and I have that in about a minute, no matter how much data I have. And then I can make new branches. I've got a sprint. It follows my preferred workflow, however I've learned how to use Git. And for every one of these, I now have a URL online where I can test my application on a byte-to-byte -byte exact copy of the application, and I've done all that in about five minutes' time. So six, six copies of the entire application, every one with their own Solar, every one with their own Redis, every one with their own database, et cetera. Now, I mentioned security, permission levels. If you've got a system that can give you lots of copies of your application, you also want to be able to 
give good permissions. So on platform, you can choose for every environment who can access it at what level. And this is very nice if you have outsourced resources, freelancers, companies that you're working with, one's backend, one's theming, then you can segregate the permissions in a very nice way. Uh, hard to read, but um, this is the CLI tool. So this is now setting up your local environment. Remember, this is the weak link that's really hard to deal with. And what platform does is only a third, a quarter of the way to a good solution. I'll explain that in a moment. But this is to the consistent deployment part. So remember, you build applications these days with like, you know, build scripts and code. This is an example of adding a module via, uh, via Drush Make, get adding it, get pushing it, and platform will use that Drush Make file to get the codes that you specified from other sources so that you can have a separation between the code you maintain, your modules, your themes, your libraries that make your site special, versus the code that you're getting from Drupal.org, GitHub, Bitbucket, NPM, PIP, whatever. Okay? So for every one of those environments, you can go see, um, you can go see uh, what's going on. So I'm going to install a theme on one of them. Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> this is uh, one of the nicest Drupal 8 themes that I could find about four months ago, or five months ago. <laughs> so we've got a, a little work to do on the selection of Drupal 8 themes, but really good starter themes. Um, not so many finished out of the box themes yet, which I, I guess is good. Okay, so that was, like I said, a fairly outdated video of Platform SH demonstrating a couple of the concepts that I was talking about. You push everything with Git. The, push, the Git push triggers a rebuild of an environment. It grabs all of the services that you want to have from a services YAML file. It configures all of the network and storage according to that YAML file. And because you keep that description of the configuration with your code, then you have a Git, re a Git repository that has a fingerprint. It's got a hash. And when you push that repository to different environments throughout your deployment workflow, you have a guarantee that you will get exactly the same bytes on the hard drive for your code in every one of them. So you have zero surprises by the time you get to production. And if you do that five, six, seven times through the different environments that I showed you, each one of them is a practice deployment and you have a lot of confidence by the time you do that into production that it's going to work exactly like you think it's going to because you've done it 5, 10, 15, 20 times already. Okay, so the benefits of all of that is that it's simple to execute, testable, repeatable, reversible, etc. Now, let's talk about Drupal 8 because I promised I would and there's a lot to talk about. So can Drupal 8 have OCD deployment? Um, one of the biggest issue with Drupal 8 and OCD deployment is the issue of CMI, okay, configuration management. So how many of you have built Drupal 8 sites of any kind? Okay, very few. You're lying. <laughs> I demand participation. <laughs> he raised his hand in, in theory. Um, how many of you have tested CMI in some way? Really, not many of you. Okay, good. So this is kind of a new topic. So let's talk about what CMI is. Configuration management. How many of you have used features in Drupal 7? A few more. Okay, great. So in Drupal 7, we developed this thing. I say we, and I had nothing to do with it. But um, they developed this thing called features, which meant that you could take uh, configuration that was stored in the database, like views, like entity metadata like Drupal variables, and you could export that uh, into what was basically PHP code. Okay, it was basically structured arrays of PHP code that you could then stick into your uh, modules, and then Drupal would, instead of having to look into the database to get this information, it would be able to look at a file on the file system, which is great because files on file systems can be versioned, can be put into Git, can be moved around, they can be packaged, whereas data in a database is really hard to get your hands on. It's really hard to share data in databases between different sites and do it in a very organized way. So 
it was all an effort to move the configuration out of the database and in, into code. And it was basically always, in most cases, generated by the web application. So it was uh, an exportable thing. Uh, if, it, if your data was exportable, then you could click export and you would get a big blob of PHP text that you would copy and paste or download and stick into a module or a function and you were good. Okay, and was added to the code base by the developer. So that's where we're coming from. With Drupal 8, um, uh, it's, it's in some ways the same. Um, so this is, um, if you see where we are, we're on the export tab of Drupal 8 um, configuration management screen, and I'm exporting the contact form um, website feedback contact form and then it's giving me this YAML and the idea here is that either with um, the very uh, wonderfully named Drush um, CEX I think it is I think it's Drush Sex <laughs> I love it uh, it's config configuration export it will do all this for you and put it into files into the staging directory for your configuration uh, or you can copy and paste this and paste it into a different Drupal site and th therefore you've transported your configuration that way. But the, the, the idea is the same. It's an export of your configuration in text and it goes eventually, if you're going to move it around, onto the file system. And theoretically, um, you would be able to um, put that into version control and have that great quality of consistency where one Git repository is going to give exactly the site that you're looking for. Okay, that's the goal. But uh, there's some challenges with this um, that weren't immediately obvious when people thought this up. So it's fine to be able to export via the UA, U, UI, but can you really add it to the code base? That's a difficult because usually when you deploy uh, code onto a server, and especially, unfortunately, to say in the platform uh, philosophy where we originally came from when we thought about web applications, the web server should never be able to write to the same directories that you're deploying code onto. That is kind of just like a, a philosophy that we thought was a good idea. Um, and in fact, uh, early versions of Acquia and Pantheon adhered to more or less the same idea. But now we've got a situation where if you think about it, I've got my website, my Drupal 8 website, and I want to export my configuration so that I can move it into a different branch. Okay, so either I want to, most likely I've got like a development branch and I want to move my configuration into the um, production branch, okay? If I want to do that with Git, then what I have to do is I have to export that using Drush or the web interface. Then I have to go into that directory on some server where the web server has done something because I need, I'm dependent on the web server for that. Then I have to version control that. I have to git add, git commit, git push that. It means my web server has to have access to my git repository. Um, and <laughs> It's a funny situation for platform because uh, we actually think it's a good idea to deploy code by writing it onto a read-only file system that has no knowledge of a Git repository to begin with for safety reasons and for consistency reasons. So it's a big challenge and we know that Pantheon and Acquia are looking at this challenge the same way. So Drupal 8's asking us to do this really weird thing where you use the web server the application to generate files that are then meant to be checked into Git. It's similar to what you did with uh, features, but with features at least, it was acknowledged that that was meant to be code, and it was meant there was an acknowledged uh, manual step by the developer that you couldn't get around. Maybe you could script it, but uh, it was still the, in essence, the web developer who had to take the feature export, put it into the code base where it's nice and safe and permissioned so that the web server can't write to it and then deploy it. So it's kind of a paradigm shift with Drupal 8 and it'll be interesting to see what solutions come out in the industry for that. There are currently no perfect solutions, which is okay because Drupal 8 isn't 
out yet officially, but that's the type of thing that you want to ask yourself if you're signing up for Drupal 8 hosting. How is that handled and what kind of security is there and will I actually be able to move CMI stuff between multiple environments? That's what I just said. And because I want to get to the questions, if you have any, and because uh, I've already talked far too long uh, for most people's interest level in the topic, I just want to give you something great to leave with, because if you actually get this all right, then I believe you can build some really big, cool things, and when you deploy that and it goes perfectly the first time, every time, it just feels so great and it looks awesome too. So that uh, is the end of my presentation, but if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So, right, so the question was, um, what's my opinion about installing solar locally for development versus connecting to an online solar that might have all the data already into it? That's obviously a good solution if it's hard for you to move the data and re-index solar locally or if it's hard for your developers to set solar up to begin with, all of which are actual likely cases. Um, that gives me an opportunity to tell you what the dream is for platform.sh and a tool that we want to build for people to use. How many of you have used Vagrant? So you know, some of you know what Vagrant is. When Vagrant is a way to run, to easily start a virtual machine locally with a, a specific configuration. And you say Vagrant up, and all of a sudden you've got a virtual machine on your local um, environment that you can access and use. And a lot of people do that these days to start specifically development environments for different projects where the uh, requirements for that project are different from one project to the other. So maybe you're working on a project with solar, maybe on the next one you're using Elasticsearch, maybe on the next one you're using Hadoop, there's no way you want to set up your laptop to be running all of those with all the different possible versions. So what you do is you make vagrant boxes that have those different versions in there. And that, especially if you use something like Ansible and Docker along with vagrant, can give you a lot of speed and flexibility in setting up the local services. So what Platform SH is working on right now is Platform Vagrant Up, which is an extension to that, which um, not only does the provisioning of the services based on that YAML file that I showed you, but it also will give you um, very fast data synchronization. So I'll say Platform Vagrant Up, and it'll not only spin up my services inside of a Vagrant box, but it'll also make a, um, what's called a copy on write uh, data synchronization. It means that you'll be able to start running on your application even though you've got 10 gigabytes of data within a couple minutes because as long as you're online, it will just pull that data progressively down as it's needed and it'll pull the bits that you need first, um, which we'll see how fast that goes, but right now, uh, when we do it between um, environments online, it's ready to go in about two minutes, one, one to two minutes. So we're hopeful that maybe three to five minutes at the worst case for a 10 gigabit data set, you'd be able to do platform vagrant up, and then you've got a complete new copy of your application with all the services and all the data in three to five minutes. So in that case, it would be better to run solar locally. If all of that's hard to do, then yes, running solar online is a really great option to do that. And with platform, you could also tunnel into the, the solar that's online and test against that. So the question is how do you move existing pro projects onto that. Well, it's the, the migration is fairly straightforward on platform. This is just a pl platform specific question now. Um, you basically push your code into the Git repository, move your uploaded files, move your database, and then you can branch that into all of the different environments and the data will then move around like normal. Um, there are some things that you might want to do, like if you don't currently build your site with Drush Make, you might want to convert it into a Drush Make file and build it that way in the future, but you don't have to. So the question is, if I'm running Drupal 7 sites, um, what do I have to do to be prepared for Drupal 8? That's a good question. I think um, I don't really have a great answer for you, except that I'm very hopeful that it's less than ever before. 
um, because the way that we're doing the data migration between seven and eight um, will basically give you a lot of control about what that looks like. Um, unfortunately, it's going to be very similar to other major point releases in that it's so much different that you will end up rebuilding your application in Drupal 8 and then migrating the data into it and you'll make some changes and you'll use the tools that are available. So the, the main thing that you want to do is you want to keep track of what functionalities there are in Drupal 8 that come closest to matching what you have in Drupal 7 because in the end, it's not going to be like you're going to take one-to-one -one the modules that you have in Drupal 7, find the same module in Drupal 8, and run update on them. It probably won't work like that in most cases. I, I'm imagining that even though it's going to be an easier migration than ever before, because you've got the migrate modules capabilities to do data transport, and you can really interface with that, it's for any real complicated site, I'm expecting it to be more like a rebuild than a migration, like or an upgrade. Wolfgang, do you see that different, or do you? Fago. Uh, okay, where do you deploy Platform SH? So Platform SH has two products right now. One's the standard product, and one's the enterprise product. The enterprise product, which is like this triple redundant, high availability, awesome thing but for big sites, like millions, million requests a month or more. Um, that can be deployed onto essentially any public cloud, but like Amazon, Google, Azure, UpCloud, we're looking for a Swiss provider, and we'd look into other public clouds if they were needed. Um, our long-term goal is that you could deploy that onto uh, private clouds, meaning your infrastructure, but that's not where it is right now. Otherwise, for platform standard, it's all on AWS right now. So that's for the standard, medium, large types of sites, up to a million page views a month in that, in that range. So not yet. So he's, he's wondering, in case you couldn't hear him, um, how to solve the problem of having your web server commit the configuration stuff to Git. There's actually even a Drush 7 command for that. <laughs> you can have, there's a Drush command in Drush 7 that will not only export your configuration, but it will push it to Git. It'll commit it to Git. So we'll see that automated in that way. It's, it's just a very weird thing to have a web server that can do such things that can first write files onto the file system and then do a git push, essentially. Um, I think, if I think about that a lot, it freaks the hell out of me. <laughs> it's, it's just a very weird situation.